Holy hell, everything's changing, and I don't just mean the crazy, weird background that we've got behind us. Look at it, it's hideous, it's so colourful, it's just making me want to creep inside and grab my soul and eat it. I go weird. So not only are we going to up and down this brand new NXT 2.0 era, I don't know if that's going to be the long term thing, but that's what everyone was calling it last night. So not only are we going to up and down this brand new era of NXT 2.0, ups and downs, everyone just kept calling it NXT 2.0 all last night, so that's what we're going to do. Not only are we doing that, but we need to talk about a few things that happened over the weekend. Because Samoa Joe vacated his belt, he vacated his NXT championship because of injuries. That was, that was really crap, that was really so Okay, we don't like that. We hope you get well soon, Joe. But this, of course, meant that we now had an NXT Championship match. On this card, it was the Fatal 4 where it was going to be the Namor Contenders match for the belt. Anyway, that was now for the big gold strap. Everything was crazy. There were twists. There were turns. There were more twists and turns than a night at your local Weatherspoons. These were NXT 2.0 things, and these are the ups and downs for those things. I'm Gareth. Let's do it. So straight away, we felt this complete overhaul of the music, the feel, the vibe, whatever you want to call it, of NXT from the get-go. You had these video packages things and all the little graphics that were highlighting what was going to come later in the night between LA Knight, Kyle O'Reilly, Pete Dunne, Tommaso Ciampa. They were talking about this big NXT Championship title match opportunity they had. But one of them wouldn't actually have this opportunity because things, like I said, took some twists and took some turns. Because probably one of the biggest things that randomly happened at the very start of the show is Rex Steiner just walked into frame and it was like hey LA Knight I like you I'm gonna beat you up you're gonna let me beat you up and LA Knight being the intelligent hyper intelligent million dollar megastar went yeah I've got the biggest opportunity of my life later in the night but I'm just gonna have a match against you right now and yes before you just throw abuse at me yes 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 we know Rex Steiner was actually called Rex Steiner all night he was called Bron Breaker with two K's why and then we segued into this brand new NXT environment and rip, rip to the plexiglass. It is done. Let's be biz. We do not miss you. Bye. But we've got this like sports hall arena type feel and I quite liked it. it did, they did something for me. I had all these bright colours everywhere. We had a new Tron, new stadium, new music. I know I was saying a lot of bad things about this logo when I first saw it, but I think it's rubbing off on me. I kind of like it. And like I said, we did have LA Knight taking on Bron Breaker. 2Ks. That was happening, this match happened, and it was really good, so it was getting up. Because LA Knight did exactly what he always does. He finds the baby face, sees them picking up momentum, and then just starts kicking him and slapping him, derailing that momentum. But Bron Breaker had everybody on his side. And anytime he just unleashed a slam or a, a big explosive bout of offense, the crowd went crazy. And there was a point where he won the match with this, but there was a point where he did a gorilla press into a power slam. It was so damn impressive, it was bright, colourful goodness, and we're not just talking about his little singlet outfit. Honestly, what a debut. What more do you need to do? It wasn't a long match, it wasn't a big epic or anything like that. He just got in there, he overcome the absolute arsehole, won the match, and now everyone loves him. And I want to see Ron Breaker break everyone. Who'd have thunk it? Then we segued into this little backstage segment thing where Ron Breaker walked to the back and he was greeted by all of his contemporaries and they were clapping their hands. They were like, yeah, go you, go Ron Breaker. And then he just stopped. So I was like, oh, that was kind of nice. Well, don't make it go. But before we could even let that sink in, we had another match. This was a match heavy night and I love that kind of stuff. Yeah, they weren't all super long epic ones. Like I just said, they were all quick and sharp and in your face and slapping you left, right and center, but it was good. It was Imperium taking on Josh Briggs and Brooks Jensen. And I really like this match as well. So it was getting up. So you kind of sense that the theme for this night was just to throw all these rookies into matches against veterans to take the pressure off more than anything. It gave them a chance to shine in the spotlight, but the likes of Imperium, the likes of LA Knight, all these dudes could, could take the, the major load of the match, so to speak. And that's sort of what happened here. Imperium controlled the match for long spells, but Josh Briggs kept exploding with big splashes. And then Jensen did like a spinning elbow thing and a really nice power slam. And can I just make a point here? Jensen is 20 years old. 20. And he's currently on NXT 2.0, whatever you want to call it. He's there doing this. What were we all doing at 20? I know it's not a competition, but my goodness, this dude, he's going to fly. Look at him. 
And yes, it wasn't as successful a night for them as it was for Brom Breaker early on the night because they did lose. It all happened when Jensen got distracted by Marcel Bartel at ringside and then Fabian Aker did his double underhook suplex thing from the top rope which looked mwah, magnificent. Imperium won. They kept up their little run of form that they're on currently. But Briggs and Jensen, I want to see more of them. So that's this match. It did everything it needed to do. It even made my arms do weird moves. We had a hit row promo where the entire gang were pretty much just putting over B-Fab because guess what? B-Fab's going to debut tonight as well it is a night of debut as I tell you and there's no point beating around this bush we did have B-Fab taking on Katrina Cortez it's gonna get an up and guess what else is gonna happen <laughs> Because not for the last time on this NXT Ups and Downs, we did have a squash zone moment because it was B-Fab just absolutely taking on Cortez. She pulverized her with forearms, really nasty like swing kicks, and there was a pump kick that she took Cortez out of the air with at one point, and I thought this lady may have just killed her. But I cannot just give it a straight up juicy squash because I don't think it was quite there. I think it was it was sweet. It had a sweet moment, so we've got a sweet potato here because there were moments in this match where I thought, yeah, B-Fab looks great. She looks violent. She looks physical. But there were times when you felt like she didn't quite have a rhythm at this moment. Yeah, this is one of her first ever matches in NXT, so that's a little bit understandable. But I think with a bit of time, B-Fab could be something special sweet. But then she did kind of get back to what she does best because she got the mic afterwards. She ran down Cortez. She was like, you, you terrible. I just beat you with a neck breaker. Ha ha. And then Electra Lopez, who's obviously part of Legado del Fantasma, who've had this big, long feud with Hit Row. She came out. They started squabbling. I really like this because they were overlapping. They weren't just waiting for each other to finish, which is, you know, what real people do. And it looks like we are going towards this Electra Lopez and B-Fab match down the line. I'm interested to see what they do with a bit of time. Hopefully they get that and get like maybe five, ten minutes just to show what they can do together because I think this one minute Squash, though impressive for B-Fab because she did win. It didn't really highlight or show off what she can do. Odyssey Jones, Johnny Gargano and Cameron Grimes were all backstage getting ready for the wedding. They had their groomsman outfits on which consisted of like long sleeve sweaters and leather gloves. Which is, if you know Dexter Loomis, it's his kind of bag, baby. And then out of nowhere, we had a big old return because Austin Theory came back from running away and they kind of acknowledged the running away by just saying, you ran away? And he went, yeah, I, I ran away. That was pretty much it. And he brought a priest with him, but not that kind of priest. He brought Damien Priest, who was just there to get pissed, really, more than anything. It was all a bit weird, but I don't know. NXT looks weird at this moment. Oh yeah, and let's just make a point of this. We're getting the first ever, I'm going to bring this up, it's the Gargano meter. We're going to get the first ever 98% very close to the top because it just filled my heart with joy, this. I loved it. I'm a fool. I know, but Johnny Gargano did not do the no-look high-five with Austin Theory at this moment. No, 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 no. Because he'd been away, because he'd been gone, he was missing. They didn't high-five, they hugged it out. I'm a fool, but my goodness, do I love a cuddle. Carmelo Hayes in the ring. He's obviously the guy who won the breakout tournament. He wants to be at the forefront of this next phase of NXT, NXT 2.0. So he came down to the ring with Trick Williams. I don't know who Trick Williams is personally. I've not seen a lot of him on NXT or anything like that, but he, he called him pretty much his insurance policy, but then Trick had a trick of his own up his sleeve. Uh. His trick pretty much consisted of telling Carmelo Hayes, you can't be humble anymore. Look where it's got you. People keep jumping you from behind. We can't be humble. Let's not be humble. We're not going to be humble. And as they went to walk out of this new colourful arena, Duke Hudson came down to the ring. He was probably set to have a match or something, but then he bumped into Carmelo Hayes and he was like, you, you got lucky. I don't like you. Disrespect. He walked past and Trick was like, nah, uh -uh, that's not going to happen anymore. You don't get to disrespect us. We're going to beat you up. And they did. And they battered him. And then the crowd kind of cheered for Carmelo Hayes, which was quite interesting because they've got this little grey area. Is this like a soft heel turn? He's not taking any schlub from anyone anymore. So it's it's quite an interesting development, to be honest. I don't know if we're going to have a Duke Hudson Carmelo Hayes rivalry going down further down the line. I probably would like to see a few matches between them. I think they've got quite nice chemistry together, even when they're just arguing. And I think Trick is a nice addition to Carmelo Hayes, the whole package of him right now, even though there was a moment where he seemed to get a bit of first night jitters. He, he, he seemed to repeat the same line over and over again, just to hope that the line came back. And we've all been there. I've been on stage. It happens. You just say the line again and just hope to God the next one comes. All of this gets a nice up though because I think it adds something fresh and new to Carmelo Hayes. And then we suddenly have Gigi Dolan and JC Jane backstage. They were like looking off camera at somebody that turned out to apparently be Mandy Rose in a hood. And they were like, we love your new look, Mandy. It looks great. And my mind instantly went to, oh my God, she's done it. She's gone bald. 
And we'll segue straight into the match that happened after this because it was Gigi Dolan and JC Jane taking on Casey Catanzaro and Caden Carter. But this little segment of this match type thing is going to get down because it brassed me off. Look, I love everybody involved. They're really good at wrestling. It's just a really good mix of people. And the actual action that was going down between the two teams, they gelled really well. It was a good little match. But about six or seven minutes in, they threw Mandy Rose into proceedings. She caused the DQ. She took a hood off and everyone was like, oh my God, she's got brown hair. And that was just the big reveal. That was it. We threw out a match just to show off that somebody had a haircut. And then Saray came down, she fought off Gigi Dolan, JC Jane, Mandy Rose fled, they got together, we cut to commercial and came back and there was a six woman tag team match, I felt like I was watching an episode of Raw, it didn't make sense. Why didn't we just do the six woman tag match in the first place? Like everyone involved had a reason to be in the match, it wouldn't have felt weird just to do it in the first place. You could have just had Mandy Rose come out onto the stage at the start, have a hood on, take it off, be brunette, that is all this added to the thing. Ah, but saying all this, even though that did annoy me, the actual six woman tag team match was quite fun. I like Mandy Rose. Rose's new attitude, she's really physical, she's hella powerful, there were some power flams and knees that she did in this match that made my jaw just dislodge from my face. And it all led to a moment late in the day where Caden Carter was like thrown against the ropes by Mandy Rose, she got a bit distracted by JC Jane trying to do a drive-by thing on the apron, it didn't work, she turned around, she got a knee to the face from Mandy Rose, got pinned, so Mandy Rose and her goon squad technically won, they won, they won this whole segment match thing that, well, it was quite extended, I'll give you that. But the fact that it was extended meant that the women did get a lot of exposure. This is something that SmackDown and Raw could probably take note of right now. But NXT, don't take note of Raw and just throw matches together in the commercial break just because. We then had Indy Hartwell getting ready for the most special day of her life. It was a wedding day. Index is going to happen. It's a thing. And Cora Jade got told to take a hat off because she'll never get married wearing a hat. And I beg to differ. If she wants to wear a hat to her wedding day, let her. Raquel Gonzalez then got like a highlight video packaging, pretty much just showing off the fact that she's the most dominant women's champion ever. And this was pretty much in the place of the Frankie Monet Raquel Gonzalez women's championship match that was going to go down on this night, but for whatever reason it was pulled. We hope everything's okay with everyone involved because it's just not great when that happens. I mean, we don't know all the information, so I'm not going to jump to any conclusions. I just hope that everyone is okay. Oh yeah, and I forgot to say, during the women's tag team match that was happening earlier on in the night, we did see in a little picture-in-picture thing, which was quite disrespectful, I went to watch the match that was going on, but we did see that Kyle O'Reilly got jumped backstage by Pete Dunn and Ridge Holland. So he's now out of that match. William Regal confirmed it. He's not going to be in the Fatal 4-Way. But in his place is the person who apparently saved him, Von Wagner. If you don't know what a Von Wagner is, I'm pretty sure the guy himself does not know what a Von Wagner is. And Von Wagner will be having his first ever proper NXT match as Von Wagner, and it's going to be an NXT Championship match. This night was crazy, wasn't it? And as promised, we did have Rich Holland and Drake Maverick, and like I'm saying, it did mean that we get to go back to my favourite place. <laughs> And even though this match is going to get an up because it did exactly what I needed to do, it made Rich Holland look like a beast, it's going to get a bitter squash because of the person that he squashed. He squashed Drake Maverick and he's my boy. He's the most entertaining little dude on wrestling television, in my eyes, really, when it comes to it. He's really good at everything he does. He just, every time he takes chicken crap and turns it into chicken salad, I feel like he gets rewarded by getting eaten alive by a monster. That's pretty much what happened here. It was like somebody threw a child into a bear cage and Holland headbutted him and did his normal than grit finish on him which was just nasty it was hard to watch but that was the idea but it was still bitter i'm very bitter about it We then had Mackenzie Mitchell backstage. She was having a chat with Tommaso Ciampa. She was saying, hey, what do you think of this new NXT 2.0 thing? And he said, well, I don't really give a toss about it. It's not about that. You can just put all that to one side. What it's about is me getting Goldie back for the first time in 908 days. And as soon as he said that, I thought, you know what? I want him to win this belt. And if he doesn't, we riot in my room. A quick video package thing in Chicago, like that's all that came up on the screen for a while. It was a guy talking in like a mafia style voice. I don't know that's how the mafia sound, but he sounded pretty much like this. And he was talking about his family, the fact that his family earns money maybe through nefarious means, but he wanted to earn money through wrestling, but there's not a lot of money in amateur wrestling, so he's going to go and make loads of money in NXT. And if you want to go and make loads of money, you're probably in the wrong company right now. And this guy's name was Tony D'Angelo. So Tony D'Angelo is coming to an NXT ring near you. I mean, there's only one of them, but he's coming there. 
Yep, like I said, we didn't just have one squash shown this evening, we didn't just get two, we're gonna have... <laughs> We've got three squash zones this week and this particular squash involving the Creed Brothers is not just going to get a sweet potato because it was juicy, it's going to get my yellow highlighter of the week because these boys are fast becoming my weekly highlight. Because they're savage, they're absolutely savage. What they did to these local competitors here on this night was, it would have been illegal, really. If they weren't in a ring, it would have been illegal. Brutus can throw people out of the ring like they're nothing, like they're feathers. People, feathers, ring, thrown, Brutus. And Julius is just a madman. When you punch him, he gets more angry, and then he picks you up, tackles you into the floor, and does something what Wade Barrett brilliantly calls the unnecessary clothesline. Because it is. The tackle's enough, and then he goes, you know what, you're going to sit up, I'm going to take your face off. He does it. They won the match, and I'm just... I start sweating when they come on screen. I'm like, oh, no, no, they're going to hurt somebody. It's not going to be me, but it's going to be someone. <laughs> But the Diamond Mines night was not done by a long shot because Malcolm Bivens took the mic and he was like, well, these dudes are really tough, but this other woman in front of me right now who looks really hench, she's also really tough. She's part of the Diamond Mines and her name is Avi Niles. You may know her from the Titan series game show thing, which was The Rock's baby, if I'm, I'm led to believe. She looks really tough. I don't want to be the first person to fight her because she looks like she could probably turn them into powder, literal human powder. And then before he could finish just talking about the fact that she's not at carbs since 2005, which really made me chuckle because Sheeta came out and he said Roderick Strong I've been away for a while but finally want to have this match are we going to do it is it going to happen Malcolm Biven said yes big money match not big money match because that would have been very weird but that's going to happen next week oh it's going to be a goodie and then we had really quickly Dexter Loomis preparing for his wedding day because that was still happening tonight. And then before we knew it, it was time for the main event of the evening. Because we did have that fatal four-way for the NXT Championship, it was Tommaso Ciampa taking on Pete Dunne, taking on LA Knight, taking on Von Wagner. What is happening? Look, I'm not going to slam this match too hard because it was thrown together. It was quite last minute in terms of its stakes, in terms of throwing just some random newbie into the match as well. It's going to get an up, but I do have a few critiques. Because for the most part, it was just a rapid dash through everyone's greatest hits. There wasn't much weight to it. There wasn't much substance. It was just, oh, he's doing his move. Oh, he's doing his move. Oh, he's doing his move. And Von Wagner can do an Olympic slam, apparently, which would have been great for some people. But for the most part, this was all about the result and the result was in the closing stages Tommaso Ciampa was able to win the match he was able to beat LA Knight and come away with Goldie oh my goodness we've got Goldie Goldie's back and anytime I see Tommaso Ciampa holding gold it just looks right it looks good he was there he was cradling Goldie he was like I'm never letting this go and it's really a, quite a wise move to be honest when it comes to NXT because Tommaso Ciampa can perfectly fill the exact same role that Samoa Joe had beforehand this veteran who was like I am the gatekeeper you have to beat me to get to the very top and I don't think many people are going to have the marbles have the stuff to beat that boy Champa. Oh, here we go. Yeah, we're getting to it. The uh, the main event segment of the evening. It was the wedding that all the people have been waiting for. And Indy Hartwell and Dexter Loomis had a video package highlighting the living nightmare that has been my life for the last eight months covering this. This wedding has been something, hasn't it? And then everyone like filed into this new NXT arena. They all sat down. We had loads of random NXT wrestlers who were part of the guest list, apparently, which was quite funny because GYV had been invited. And I'm not sure how any person in this like closed the way circle would have invited GYV, but they were there and they predicted madness, but they didn't get that kind of madness. It was, it was a weird wedding because we didn't have people turning on each other. We didn't have sudden twists like you're the father, I'm the father. I don't know why anybody would randomly be the father, but you get my drift. No, instead it was just bickering and weird improvised theatre. It felt like a show. It felt like a random theatre show where nobody knew what the lines were and they were just riffing off each other. Like Ikim and Jiro randomly had the wedding rings and like, I don't know, for some reason Austin Theory was like, that's my guy. And I was like, you guys know each other? I don't know what's happening. And then after Indy Hartwell did this long speech about her vows, now but she loves him, loves Dexter Loomis, Dexter Loomis just did that. And the, the priest, the actual priest who was there was not happy with this. And he said, come on, dude, you got to say something from your heart. So he did. He choked him. He choked the priest because Dexter Loomis. Oh yeah, and before this, when they did the speak now, forever hold your peace thing, everyone like put their hands up to say, this is not a good idea. And Dexter Loomis showed off an axe and stared at them all like he was going to kill them. NXT.
But in the end, after some weird drama and Andre Chase suddenly just saying, like, did someone say Andre Chase instead of let's cut to the chase? Again, baffling. Odyssey Jones had to put him down. This was just a weird wedding. After all that, they finally did put the rings on each other. They got married happily ever after. Yay! But no twist, no turn, no heel turns. Just a moment. Like, it was a, yeah, admittedly happy moment, but it was just there. It was weird. It was a bit dull, in all honesty, so I'm probably going to give it a down just for that. But I, I didn't get anything from this. I was trying my best to find something, but it felt weird and clunky. And, like, they'd just gone, go out there, guys. Go and have fun. And I didn't. <laughs> so I'm sorry. I hope you did like this wedding. It was a weird way of ending the first episode of this new era of NXT. You probably should have just ended with, you know, a person being crowned the brand new top champion in the promotion, all that stuff. But what do I know? I'm just a dude in a red t-shirt sweating. But those have been your ups and downs for this week's NXT 2.0, the first ever. I'll give it an up. It was positive. It surprised me. I thought it was going to be really terrible and awful and all the rest of it. I think a lot of people did. But it did have some positive moments and just had an awful lot of weird ones. It's going to take a while to shake off the weirdness, isn't it? So let me know what you think of all these ups and downs in the comments section right down below. And do not forget to like the video, share the video, subscribe to all things What Culture Wrestling. Follow myself on Twitter at GMorgan04 and follow everybody here at What Culture, at What Culture WWE. But more importantly than all of this, everything's changing in WWE right now. Everything's changing in wrestling. Big E is the WWE champion. NXT has gone weirder and greater and colourfuler. It's odd. And AEW is doing its thing. But with all this change, we will always stay the same here in, in What Culture Wrestling. We will continue to bring you the goods, I'll bring some goods, I'll bring some ballot t-shirts, and you bring your nice looking self.